All right, before we actually start to get into the review here, I need to mention two very important things. One of which is, yes, this video will contain potential spoilers. If you care about any spoilers whatsoever regarding your Pokemon game, this is your warning. Also, why do you care about spoilers about the Pokemon game? Do with this what you will. Number two, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are the worst names in any Pokemon game ever. People would maybe argue X and Y are worse, but just taking the last names and putting Ultra in front of them almost makes it feel like the remakes. Just bear with me here for a second. We've got Red and Green, Fire Red and Leaf Green. We've got Gold and Silver, Hard Gold and Soul Silver. We've got Ruby and Sapphire, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. And now we've got Sun and Moon. Which, these aren't remakes. <laughs> these are the third installment in this generation. Which, that's another thing. We didn't get a third installment in Generation 6. We're now getting one in Generation 7. And in Generation 5, we had Black and White 2, which wasn't the third installment, but it was sequels. So, I went into this game knowing pretty much nothing about it. And I did expect it somewhat to be a sequel because there's two games. But it's not. It's the mentality of a third and final game in a generation, with the sales tactics of still being able to sell to games. And while that is not necessarily bad, it was a little bit surprising to me. Imagine my surprise when I booted up the game, expecting some kind of sequel-ish game at least, and seeing an intro sequence which is exactly the same as Pokemon Sun and Moon. At first, I genuinely thought, because I have both games digitally from the Nintendo eStore, I booted up the wrong game. I thought I had booted up Pokemon Moon. I didn't. The game starts exactly the same, and it doesn't take too long for the first visual differences to make an appearance, because in the cutscene where Lily is running in the Eighth Paradise, you actually see two cyborg-type people, rather than two employees of the Aether Foundation. And when you get to play the game, it's immediately apparent, I mean... Choosing your starters, done in a different location, in a different manner, in a different everything. It's very obvious this is a slightly different game. And to its credit, the exposition and starting up of the game is done way, 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 way better. The pacing is way quicker and they don't really waste any time. Another thing I have to applaud the game for, and I don't remember how Pokemon Sun and Moon did this per se, but even in the early game, there's a really wide variety of Pokemon to catch. And honestly, most of your team you'll end up with, at least in my case, you can catch within the first couple of routes. I'm not going to go down to the story too much, because it is mostly the same as Pokemon Sun and Moon. You go in your island challenges, and you do your trials and your grand trials, but as you go along them, you'll find these totem stickers scattered around the world. There's a hundred of them in total, and... If you collect them at a certain number, at like, I think, 20, 40, 70, and 100, maybe there's another one in there somewhere, I don't really know for sure. You can go talk to Professor Oak, not the one from Kanto, but the one that's here because it's Professor Oak, but he's got darker skin, so he's definitely not the same. And he'll give you a totem Pokemon, actually. What's the use of that? Are they more powerful? Do they learn special moves? No, 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 they're just bigger. It's nothing special about them, they're just bigger. That's all. At first when I heard this, I thought you would be able to make one of your Pokemon totem-sized. That's not the case, you just get another Pokemon which is totem-sized. And... Other than that, they're exactly the same. The only thing that's different is the weight and the size. So things like Grass Knot will do more damage against them. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh... It's not particularly great, if you ask me. So, of course... This game being pretty much identical to Pokemon Sun and Moon, you still got Team Skull and you still got the Aether Foundation. But other than those two, we also have the Ultra Recon Squad, which are the cyborg type people you discover way early on in the game. And they pretty much pop up after every single trial you do. And sometimes they just talk to you for a little bit, sometimes they give you some exposition, and sometimes you actually get to battle them. The first time you battle them, they have a normal Pokemon, a Furfru. But then every single time you battle them after that, they have a Poipol, which is a rare kind of Pokemon that you can't find in Alola. And immediately when you read that, you're going like, oh, it's an Ultra Beast. 
It's definitely an Ultra Beast. And then it kills one of your Pokemon because it's actually pretty powerful. And it has an ability called Beast Boost. We all know that ability probably, don't we? And that confirms, yes, it is an Ultra Beast and these Ultra Raycon Squad. I mean, the name kind of gives it away. Are from Ultra Space. And they are here to protect the light of Alola because in their world, the light got eaten or absorbed or stolen or something along those lines by a Ultra Beast we know very well. You see, in Pokemon Sun and Moon, if you've caught all the Ultra Beasts, you can finally battle the quote-unquote final boss of the game, which is Necrozma. In this game, it's a more important story element, because Necrozma is actually the one stealing the light from their world, and they're here to protect the light from Alola and try to find a way to get rid of Necrozma, or at least get the fucking light back. And to do that, they're pretty much a neutral party in between all of these teams. They do talk to you and are friendly to you, and they ask you to help them, but they also side with the Aether Foundation. Shouldn't have done that, because Lucimine, the president of the Aether Foundation, is like, Oh, wormholes, you can you can help me go into an ultra wormhole? Let's do that. And then she does it for her own reasons, rather than trying to help her. And of course, that doesn't end up very well, so once she goes into the Ultra Wormhole, it is pretty much the same as in the original game, and you go to the Altar of the Sun or the Altar of the Moon, depending on the version of the game you have. At which point the Ultra Recon Squad is like, you shouldn't do that, we'll deal with this ourselves. And then when you end up there, they suddenly want you to help again. They don't really know what they want, to be honest. Unlike in Pokemon Sun and Moon, though, you don't go into the Wormhole to battle Lucamine in some kind of... Really? weird fight. They actually get thrown out. Losing me and Guzma. And Necrozma comes into your world. This isn't good. And depending on the version you have, you have just summoned Salgaleo or Lunala and it will fight Necrozma. And it'll lose. And Necrozma absorbs it, making it even more powerful. And now you get to battle Necrozma with a legendary Pokemon absorbed. Which actually is a pretty easy fights, all things considered. And right after that, you go into a sort of mini game, which this is the first time I've ever seen a 3DS game do it in this way. But it's a quote-unquote motion-controlled mini game. It uses your 3DS gyroscope to control you flying on the legendary Pokemon to Ultra Space. Finishing that mini game, you get to the home world of the Ultra Recon Squad, where Necrozma actually resides on top of a tower people build. I don't know why it resides on top of a tower, which is clearly meant to imprison it. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Again, it's Pokemon. Don't really care too much about the story. But then when you go up there and fight it, it transforms into a weird dragon thingy, and it is actually very powerful. It uh, swept my entire team away first time I fought it, and then second time I fought it, I just spammed revives and used first impression with my Glisspot, and that kind of work to kill it, so yeah, it's uh, it's like totem Pokemon, which are, as it is, pretty overpowered and not always a lot of fun, on steroids. If I wouldn't have had this tactic with reviving and a move which was really powerful and super effective that I could revive every single time, uh, which had priority I might add, because you're not going to outspeed this thing unless you're really, really, really high level. This fight seems close to impossible. So you either need something that's really, really, really defensive and also can deal a lot of damage, which, rough combination, or something that has priority and can do a lot of damage with that priority, and that leaves pretty much only something with Sucker Punch or First Impression. That being said, though, if you can actually defeat it after about 50 times, you get a free Poipoil, which... You might think, nice, it's a legendary Pokemon, it's an Ultra Beast, I've gotten something really powerful for free. It's not that powerful, to be honest. It's actually kind of weak. It can evolve, but even then it's level 40. At this point, your Pokemon are at least level 50. So, is it worth it? If you really need a poison type, it might be. Otherwise, not really. And that's pretty much the story. Now going for some gameplay things. There's a couple of trials that have been changed. The electric type trial has been changed and it has made, been made a little bit more fun because now, instead of it being a quiz, it's a puzzle. It's not a difficult puzzle, but it's a puzzle. And it's a lot more fun and a lot more engaging. And then the last trial, the fairy type trial, 
requires you to go battle a number of captains across every single island, which is just stretching out game time. And honestly, this game doesn't need to be stretched out because it's pretty long as it is. Luckily though, after finding the first captain you need to battle, every single captain can take you to the next one without you having to look for them or having to walk around everywhere. So that saves you a little bit of time, but it's still a couple of battles you need to do and it's fun, but it feels like artificial game length and that's why I have an issue with it. Then again, I had a lot of fun battling all these captains, so is it bad? Is it not bad? I don't know. I'll leave that up to you to decide. Then, you have finally finished every single trial, every single grand trial. You're ready to go to the Pokemon League. After entering the mountain, which isn't called Victory Road, which still bothers me, you actually can go catch Sorgaleo or Lunala, depending on your version of the game, because you didn't get to catch it at the climax of the story, like you would usually do in the Pokemon game. Uh, it actually goes with Lily to the Aether Paradise to be restored and healed and stuff. And just before you go to the Pokemon League, you can go capture it, but you need to go to the first island and doesn't really make itself very apparent you can do that. It's mentioned once very briefly and not very specifically. And then going through not Victory Road, you actually run into a Krozma. Really, there's no way you can not run into him. He is uh, run out of energy and stuck in a crater and you can give him some of your light from your sea power rain thingy. And he fights you, and he's level 65, which is pretty high because the rest of your team, other than Sogaleo and Lunala, is probably about 55 at this point, and Sogaleo and Lunala, if you have them, are level 60. Catching this thing will make Koras appear, and he gives you two key items. One to fuse the Krozma with Sogaleo, and one to fuse it with Lunala. And you should do that. You should definitely do that, because when you fuse them, not only do they become very, very powerful, the Krozma's usual stat title is 600 which is under a usual legendary pokemon but when you fuse them it becomes a nice 680 and it becomes an actual legendary pokemon stat wise but it can also do something called ultra boost and that's pretty much an equivalent to mega evolution or primal reversion where its stat total becomes very very high it becomes one of the most powerful Pokemon in the game, only being under Mega Mewtwo and Mega Rayquaza, but still above Arceus. And I want to remind you, you can get this before the Elite Four and the Champion fights, making the last part of the game laughably easy. Because not only can it do this Ultra Burst thing, but after it's done that, it still has a Z-move, because it doesn't require a Mega Stone or some other shit. It requires its Z-Crystal, to do Ultra Burst, but it also can use that, of course, for its Z move. So, you first Ultra Burst, become very powerful, and then use one of the most powerful moves in the game. That'll kill pretty much everything. At any time, anywhere. Then, getting to the Elite Four, I was got a little bit of guard, because I was expecting the four Kahunas, of course. Uh, two of them are, two of them aren't, and that kind of almost killed me because I wasn't expecting that, and suddenly I was fighting a team full of Steel Pokemon, and I didn't have anything to deal with that. Not even the Krozma's very, very powerful moves and stats were enough. Almost. I mean, with a little bit of HP left, with one Pokemon, I did defeat him, and then I went on for the champion battle, because I did remember that was very difficult on Pokemon Sun and Moon themselves fighting Kukui. And the game actually knows that you know this. The game is fully aware, you know you're going to fight him. So you don't fight him, you actually fight your rival. Which is a lot easier. I didn't get hit once against fighting How? Granted, I had Ultra and Krozma, but I almost died with that in like one or two Elite Four members. And then the champion battle was very, very easy. It's a little bit anticlimactic to be honest. And that's your credits roll. There's a very long credits roll with some cutscenes showing you how everybody ends up and just the usual things that happen during credits. And then, after which you have a post-game episode like you usually get in Pokemon games these days. Team Rainbow Rocket. Something that took the internet by storm the moment the information was released. And it's just fan service. You get to fight every single team leader from the previous generations with the respective legendary Pokemon. Does it make any sense? No, it definitely doesn't. One interesting thing though is Maxi and Archie from Ruby and Sapphire 
actually have the ruby and sapphire designs rather than the mega ruby and alpha sapphire designs. There's some interesting theory potential there, but the whole thing with like timelines and time travel or dimensional travel and ultra wormholes, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Don't think about it, just have fun fighting these nostalgic villains because that's the only reason they're in this game. And then there's also a shit ton of legendary Pokemons and Ultra Beasts to catch after that, but that's just post-game time filler and for those who want to fill up the Pokédex. Like me, I'm still working on that living Dex. I'm getting close. Ugh. Thank you so much for watching this review of Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Don't forget to leave a like and comment down below what you thought about the game. Don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with my newest content or watch one of the two videos appearing on screen right now. Until the next time, I'll see you all later. Bye.